Hi there, and welcome to the program. The Belt and Road Media Community Summit Forum convenes in December 2022. It is the seventh summit of this kind. The summit first started in 2016. The Belt and Road Media Community is the world's first international media alliance to be centered on the Belt and Road Initiative with 141 members and partner organizations in 62 countries and regions. How has this community influenced the international media cooperation over the years? And how can the Belt and Road Media Community pull up the information gap caused by the predominance of Western news media? For more discussion, we have Wang Yiwei, Jean Monnet Chair Professor and Director of the Institute of International Affairs at Renan University of China. We also have Luke Bensa, Chief Representative to China of the African Film Association. And also we have Alexei Nikolov, Managing Director of RT. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Let's talk about the Belt and Road Initiative and a very important media initiative under this very important framework. Professor Wang, uh, let me start with you um, from where you are in Beijing, China. When people think about the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, they think about economic corridors, they think about investment initiatives, infrastructure, power plants, but it's much more than that, right? Uh, there's such a thing as Belt and Road Media Community uh, that involves the media organizations from the partnering countries. Why is that initiative important in your opinion? Partial globalization uh, is maritime globalization. Uh, since 90% of the trade is through the, uh, the uh, sea. So coastal areas are to be uh, rich and uh, landlocked uh, areas and the countries are very poor. So how to bridge the gaps, um, build and road to the mutual connectivity and also uh, infrastructure building. I think that's to help those countries to reach the goal of the SDG and uh, 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 share the experience like China's modernization. How is it going along in your opinion? And what are the challenges and what are some of the signature projects that have been uh, already underway? Perhaps you can give us a bit of introduction on that. The first challenge uh, is uh, the Belt Initiative is one to make the globalization towards more balanced, inclusive, and uh, uh, all win and um, uh, but now the globalization is in danger. Some people even uh, claim that at the end of the globalization. In the second, uh, in the BRI countries, actually, they are economic relatively poor, but uh, uh, political and uh, uh, social systems actually they are more Western style. So it's not a match so well. It's how to bridge the gap domestically? So many uh, legal, political, geopolitical risks. And also the challenges also from the Chinese side that when the Chinese economic uh, relatively uh, slowing down, uh, the COVID uh, also uh, uh, biggest big uh, obstacles for Chinese people to travel abroad and uh, and vice versa. So all these challenges actually we are we are we are facing. Yeah, it is the hope of some that um, there can be further optimization of uh, travel policies so that there can be more international exchange. Uh, between China and the rest of the world. Uh, Alexei Nikolov, uh, welcome to the hub on CGTN. Uh, RT is a very important partner network of CGTN. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, being on your channel a couple of times. Uh, I thank you for those opportunities. Uh, we know that RT is, you know, uh, in, a, in a pretty difficult situation in Europe. You know, while it is very popular in many other parts of the world, in the global south, for example, and among the leftists in Latin America and in Europe, um, uh, talk to us about the challenges you're facing. Do you think those, um, you know, obstacles, hindrances are fair? Um, uh, I just want to get your thoughts on that in the beginning. Thank you for having me. No, answering your last question, it, the answer is very simple. No, it's totally unfair and moral. It's totally against the very idea of the freedom of media and the freedom of speech. This principle has been totally neglected by the UK now and part of the, uh, the mainstream Europe, so the European Union. Whatever they do not like is being called, labeled as disinformation, fake news, and whatever you like. And when you ask what, uh, what is the proof, where, where are the facts, there are no facts. I say, oh no, well, no, it's disinformation. So obviously the very principle, no matter what they say, it's very simple. The very principle of the freedom of speech is neglected and thrown, thrown out the window. S certainly this doesn't make our job easier, but it makes it more interesting. 
All right, Alexei, uh, we understand the plight of RT. Um, I know that, uh, like you said, it was uh, banned uh, by the UK authorities as early as this spring, right? And uh, if you look at YouTube, some other major Western social media networks, RT uh, channels have been targeted. Many of its videos have been taken offline. Um, how are its anchors, reporters, and staff co been coping with all that? As a matter of fact, I received the letter, the good old British style letter on paper oh. from, the UK from the UK government saying I'm banned. So I made a very nice plaque, which is now standing on my work table. And the same holds true for all my colleagues. Obviously, they are being targeted. They are being prosecuted. Uh, we are being banned by the European Union in a totally unlawful, illegal manner. If you think about that for a second, the, the European Union is putting a ban on the broadcasting of the RT. The fact is that the EU member countries never ever gave the EU the right to issue licenses or to withdraw licenses. People who used to swear by the law, the rule of law, now saying, no, we do not care for law anymore. We care, it's the rules-based world. Yeah, the, thank you for, for shedding light on those perspectives. Um, uh, Luke, you're a familiar face. You played in the movie about Bruce Lee. Uh, you're a martial artist, in fact. Um, how do you look at the merits of um, you know, cultural communication through films, through movies, and through those mass media platforms? Uh, when we're doing movie is to, first of all, to, uh, 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 to promote uh, the culture of, uh, you know, uh, 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 for example, I came in China because of Bruce Lee movie or Jackie Chan movies, you know, because I was uh, a fan of uh, Bruce Lee movies and Jackie Chan movies, to why I came in China. So we make movie is to, first of all, to uh, uh, come to let people to come together and to exchange in a different manner, um, cultural way, economic way, and education way. This is what we uh, we we doing movie for that. I mean, is to united people and then to exchange to see how what how we can you know uh, come in common together and exchange together. This is what we uh, uh, we we do movie for. You know, we we need to do our own research on what we do if on what we see, you know, I mean, in the point of my view, I need to do a lot of research, first of all, to do my research, and then to see what I see right now on the TV on media, if it's true or not, you know. Yeah, fact finding is very important, but many argue that we're actually living in a post-truth world. Uh, that term, actually, the use of that term increased uh, by some 3,000, 4,000% uh, in the years of 2016 and 2017 compared with the years previously. Um, Post-truth, of course, has been defined as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping political debate or public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Um, Professor Wang, are we living in a post-truth world uh, where facts don't matter or you know, uh, everyone is entitled to their own facts. This is a big problem, actually. When in the digital world, people have more access to the information, but uh, uh, actually, it's, it's more um, live in your circles, actually. Uh, people say this is a, a cocoon, actually. Uh, it's not an open mind. Uh, yeah, information you know, like, uh, cocoon, right? It's, it's a big problem. So. People say that, that uh, you have more freedom, you have more freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and the freedom of access to information. But more freedom is good for the world. Uh, now, uh, it's people think that uh, we need authority. Uh, we need uh, the government to provide most authority of uh, information to the public. But uh, the government also sometimes to be influenced by the capital. So we need uh, our independent uh, uh, government which can uh, get rid of uh, the capital's influence uh, to provide uh, the uh, actually uh, abstract uh, information for all the people, to benefit all the people, not just benefit for our interest groups. For instance, about the COVID, about the virus, so many rumors. So who can be trusted? Even some scientists uh, 
even uh, the behind they have the interest uh, uh, influence. So today's world, we need we need to get rid of the capitalist influence. Okay, Alexei, uh, what do you see as the mandate of RT? Uh, I mean, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, once said that it is very important to uh, provide alternative news and views uh, than those already given by the Western world. Um, now we're living in the latter part of 2022. Um, what do you see as the mandate, as the mission of RT these days? I think the word alternative that you used is probably the, the answer. The key thing that we believe in is we believe in the right of people to hear the other side of the story. That's pretty much what we are doing. We are telling the world, the not just those who are interested in Russia, but people who want to know the news, people who are educated enough and independent uh, thinking enough to claim the other side of the story. We're telling them what's being misrepresented by the mainstream media or covered one in, from one side or not covered at all by the mainstream media. And we respect the audience, we respect the people much more than the traditional Western media. We believe they should be able to get different viewpoints. We believe in their right. We believe in th they are entitled to get more sources. We respect our audience. We respect their intelligence. And we come up with the facts that they may like or dislike, that they may agree with or disagree with, but we, in principle, we believe that they are entitled to different source of information, which is why we stand by our slogan, question more, which means don't take everything you are told for granted. Don't, don't buy it immediately. Question what you are being told. Uh, what is the viewership like for RT in the global south? I mean, in uh, Africa, for example, in Latin America, uh, and in many parts of uh, you know uh, Middle East and Southeast Asia. Um, and also, how would you compare the viewership there versus um, the access span, the inaccessibility in Western Europe and North America? I heard that some people are using a VPN to access your program in Western Europe, right? Uh, yes. Your last remark is very interesting. As a matter of fact, we helped to boost the VPN industry in Germany, for example. All of a sudden, VPN was virtually unknown to, to most people in Germany. They didn't need, yeah. need it. All of a sudden, it's an exponential growth in use of VPN. And it's all attributed to their desire to watch RT and Deutsch. Answering your first question, it all has to be uh, rated by the by the language version, because as you know, we have many language versions. When you're talking about Latin America, it's RT and Espanol, which is hugely yeah. popular. In some of the countries, it's um, it has an on-air access, like one of your top channels, like in Argentina and Bolivia and Venezuela. So we are hugely popular, both as a separate channel and as a supplier of the, our news bulletins for the local channels. In the Middle East, of course, it's RT and Arabic, Rusi al Yam, which has been this year. We just got the statistics by uh, on our uh, in our online services and YouTube and our website, which is very clearly very, very objective, which we are very glad about. Uh, for Africa, of course, it depends upon what part of Africa you're talking. Part of Africa is covered by RT Arabic. Part of Africa is RT en France. And again, that's interesting. Uh, the French RT, uh, RT in French, is banned in France, but it's growing exponentially in the French-speaking part of America. Algiers. Luke Niger, is from Gabon, a French-speaking, uh, a francophone African country. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. We yes, yes. This is it. Yeah, but we we receive more different programs for different country but more influenced by because it was colonized by French so has Mr. Alex Nicholas what, what he said this is uh yeah this is true so we have uh, influenced by you know um, Canal Plus French TV or whatever uh, on the French speaking part but in the other part we have also uh, uh, different uh, you know uh, programs uh, uh, we've seen mm -hmm. by different country yeah 
Yeah, Alexei, mm-hmm. why don't you finish there? Uh, it took us some time to leave the Western uh, Western owned satellite services to move to Russian Russian satellites. Fortunately, we we have good satellite system. And so mm-hmm. we're using the Russian satellite, including the one which is hanging over Africa. And of course, going to the English speaking Africa, we now have a large hub in uh, Johannesburg and uh, Joburg in South Africa. We're getting more and more visibility in countries like Nigeria and Kenya and Uganda and so on. Again, it's in the process. And the same holds true for Asia, where we're we're strong. Of, of course, you know, we have a growing footprint in China and it's the same in India, in Pakistan, in Thailand, in Malaysia, Indonesia. So at the end of the day, I think there were, there were some benefits in this situation when we were banned yeah. from the traditional West. Well, uh, diversified news, views, opinions are very important in this day and age. Um, Luke, you came to China at the tender age of 14, right? Yeah. And have stayed on and you have been in China now for what, over 30 years. Uh, you're yeah. a martial artist. You starred in many movies. Um, what would you see as, uh, you know, really the merits, like I asked you previously, um, through your own experience, the merits of your many movies, your cultural products, the films that you've participated in, in, ch- in changing perceptions, in winning hearts and minds? Then I came in China, it was 1983, I was 14 years old, and then China was just so open. But what we see right now, China is more open to the world. Uh, my objective is clear. I came is to do martial arts and then to give to the uh, to other people and to promote the, the Chinese culture and the African culture, both to come together and to see what is the possibility, uh, both to come together and then uh, in different specific way. It can be agriculture, exchange, economics way, education, and in many different you know, uh, uh, aspects. So what we see right now, um, China has a big influence in Africa, and then we see a different TV series in Africa. We see uh, you know, uh, many different programs on TV and on both sides, uh, Chinese government, African government, they come together and how to have a win-win on the uh, different uh, aspects, you know, mostly on the uh, television, film infrastructure, uh, multi broadcasting program copyright. So what we see is a huge, you know, uh, uh, good aspect uh, in, 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 in this, you know, media area. Mm. You think uh, films and movies are in a unique position to change perceptions, even more so sometimes than news media? Um, hard yeah, news, movie. Example. Yes, because you know, when we talk, uh, uh, when we, we hear about the country, is two aspects. One is sport, and the, the second is movie. So when we say Bruce Lee, we think about China. You know, when we say football, we think about Brazil or, you know, whatever. You know. And now maybe Morocco yeah. or Croatia. Yeah. <laughs> yes, this is it. Yeah, so uh, uh, sport and culture. Russia did happened. well too in 2018. Yes, yeah, this is it. <laughs> so sports and culture has always been the key to uh, understand or the key to move or the key to go to this country to discover the country. So sport and, and, and uh, culture and movie both doing, they have uh, this kind of content, you know, to let the people to go there to understand what's going on there. Uh, Professor Wang, uh, Luke just mentioned sports and films as two vehicles in driving goodwill and promoting uh, publicity of a country and also mutual understanding. Uh, Do you agree? I mean, how can people really tell China's stories well, which is uh, made a national mandate by the Chinese government? Uh, Indeed, uh, we say the Chinese dream is not just about the Chinese people's dream. It's also including, like uh, Luke, uh, African people. Uh, came to China and uh, to touch Chinese culture like Kung Fu and then achieve their dream. Uh, many uh, make huge uh, successful stories uh, with China 
uh, experience and uh, when they work and uh, with Chinese culture and the Chinese colleagues. So uh, the African stream in China or Chinese stream uh, through other people. So I think this is the human uh, dream. Uh, so like China story is not just a, a Chinese uh, story uh, per se. It's uh, like a lift of poverty, anti-corruption, but also human uh, story happened in China. Now, uh, like uh, the CO2 emission, cut CO2 emission neutrality, it's everywhere. I think we can share the experience. So in this regard, actually, the narrative of the Chinese uh, publicity, we changed from the socialism with the Chinese characteristics to Chinese modernization. I seek more common ground, common, uh, common values with all the human beings, not just say, oh, you are special, you are uh, with the Chinese characteristics. I think that's more attractive to the world. Alexei, uh, can you perhaps share with us some of the Russian experience and the experience of RT in telling uh, Russia stories, so, or as you put it, uh, pre presenting alternative viewpoints to a global audience? Let's talk this uh, talk about this story about Syria, about the so-called humanitarian mission of the white helmets. We've been exposing the lie about the real mission and the real role of the so of the so-called humanitarian white helmets at numerous occasions. We showed the how the provocation in Duma, which was alleged to be uh, a, um, an action of President Assad against people, pop, uh, uh, peaceful population, how it was staged. And we show, we've shown beyond any doubt that this was a provocation, that it never, it, it never was an action of the Assad government forces. Um, this coming March, there will be five years since the so-called poisoning of Skripals in Salisbury. And we had many, many, and we intend to have more programs showing that the official UK go government's version of the events was physically important, impossible, and chemically impossible. Um, you take so many subjects that we've been covering from the other side. Uh, in the past 15 years, I, I, I think I, I really could talk about dozens of examples. And every time we're saying all we are claiming is that we have the different story. Please let people look in the, at the facts presented from two sides and let them make their own choice. So look, in your opinion, how can China project its soft power more effectively and efficiently? Um, how can China really come across as a more likable country, uh, especially, uh, you know, among the Western societies? I think... Um... Since I came in China, uh, the key uh, of uh, of the China uh, in China is to open to the world, to share to the world what they have in economically, uh, uh, culture in cultural way, and even sport way, is to give to the world and then to give them uh, to do the uh, exchange. Uh, since I came in here, I grew up in here, which is China is my second country. We can say politic directions are always to give to the world in uh, 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 you know the, uh, uh, on cultural way, and then to exchange what we have. I can give to you on a win-win uh, partnerships. You know partnership. This is all I uh, have been uh, seeing. You know, uh, Professor Wang, uh, how do you see the benefits of media cooperation among the Belt and Road Initiative countries uh, going forward. How important is it for them to work together? Any specific uh, projects or forms of cooperation that you would advise them to do? Uh, the Belt Road Initiative, there's uh, three key principles, uh, joint consultation, co uh, construction, and uh, uh, benefit uh, for all. So you need to consult each other. Uh, because of the projects are built outside of China. So the Chinese uh, designing engineering workers need to consult with the local people to learn from each other. Uh, and because uh, infrastructure building, mutual connectivity, all many projects is 10 years, even uh, longer. So we need to uh, uh, work together for a long time. And also uh, you need a soft infrastructure uh, building, not uh, you know, like different system. Uh, uh, linguistic system, legal system, political system, and the different uh, social and habits. Uh, and even many uh, people, uh, many uh, countries live in 
the Muslim world. So we need to learn from each other. So that's very important for media corporations who understand each other, they bridge this infrastructure, soft infrastructure gap. And for the uh, uh, Belarus Initiative, we have the media corporation forum actually. Uh, on the, next year, we will have the third uh, international uh, forum on the Belarus Initiative cooperation. Definitely, we have the, uh, the media corporation uh, forum again, which organized usually by the people Daily in China. We have uh, more than actually 100 countries and uh, a thousand, uh, the hundreds of the uh, media from the, all the world, including some non PRI countries, um, uh, participated in this forum because they will also have their third party market uh, cooperation, uh, like uh, uh, the British uh, uh, media. Alexei, finally, uh, the same question to you. Uh, in your opinion, how should the BRI media organizations work closer together going forward? Uh, what kind of cooperation do you hope to see to happen amongst themselves? I think this is a great thing as a principle, as another gravity point that establishes itself as, as an alternative. Again, I like this word as an alternative point as an alternative place so we should use whatever use we we all have lots of, of, of possibilities we have lots of reserves i mean cg has many great sources of information not only in china but in many other countries like in africa we are very strong in africa rt is strong with our expertise and with our uh, sources not only in russia but also also in many countries in the, of the Central Asia where Russian is spoken traditionally. We have a lot of sources, very good information sources and experts in the Ukraine itself or coming from Ukraine. And I'm sure the same holds true for India and it's the, it will be the same for Afghanistan, for Tajikistan, for Kazakhstan. We all have our strong points, we all have our networks of information. Mm -hmm. We should make, I think we should make this um, ever, everything around the uh, belt uh, organization should be made more structurally organized, look more like a properly functioning organization with our own resources, with our own executive uh, people making it all happen. I see a lot, a lot, huge potential in this one. Alexei, Luke, and Professor Wang, thank you all so very much, gentlemen. Um, we learned a lot. Come back, please. All right, that will do it for this edition of the Hub on CGTN. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. I'll see you again soon.